We come now to the 18th study in our camp program here in British Columbia, 1983. And this is the 2.30 study on Tuesday afternoon. Now come right back to the study of the life of Jesus Christ. I want to pick up the point which we were, which was given to us on page 85 of the book Desire of Ages this morning. And that thought is concerning the fact that Jesus Christ seemed to know the scriptures from beginning to end. Now we can't overstress the fact that uh, one of the most important factors in living a truly righteous life which means, of course, to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, is to know that word. Now, Christ certainly knew it. He knew it extremely well. He knew every um, command given in the Old Testament. He understood the principles. He understood the true import of what was written. And when he was faced with the authority of the priests and rabbis who said, now do this and do that, and why don't you do this and do that, and why don't you respect the uh, powers that be, then he would say, but it is written. Again, it is written. Again, it is written. And thus he lived by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. In Ministry of Hearing, page 458, and across to page 459, we read this statement in regard to the same principle of knowing the word of God. The reason why the youth and even those of more mature years are so easily led into temptation and sin is they do not study the word of God and meditate upon it as they should. Now if we take that sentence and uh, instead of relating it to the ordinary person's experience related instead to Christ's experience we'll find it would read as follows the reason why Jesus was not led into temptation and sin is because he did study the word of God and meditate upon it as he should whereas of course um, the reason why many others of us do not uh, overcome sin is because we do not study God's word and meditate upon it as we should now I'll read further the lack of firm decided willpower which is manifest in life and character results in neglect of the sacred instruction of God's word they do not by earnest effort direct the mind to that which will inspire pure holy thought and divert it from that which is impure and untrue. There are few who choose the better part, who sit at the feet of Jesus, as did Mary, to learn of a divine teacher. Few treasure his words in the heart and practice them in the life. The truths of the Bible received will uplift mind and soul. If the word of God were appreciate, appreciated as it should be, both young and old, would possess, an, would possess an inward rectitude, a strength of principle that would enable them to resist temptation. Now, did Jesus Christ receive the word of God as a boy? Most certainly. What was the result? His mind was uplifted and so was his soul. He appreciated the word as, as it should be appreciated and he possessed an inward rectitude, a strength of principle that, that enabled him to resist all temptation. Now, we're looking now at the story of the days of conflict in the life of Jesus Christ to find out that from every possible direction Satan brought tremendous pressure to bear upon that young mind and that young soul in a desperate effort to lead him to turn aside from the written word from, and from God's direct commandments to follow the ways and traditions of men. They tried to trick him, to seduce him, to impress him, to coerce him, to force him, but every effort in their part completely failed. I read now from page 85 to page 86 in Desire of Ages. And, and we're, we're looking now for a, a succession of pressures at, at various levels against the Son of God. They, that is the uh, Jewish uh, teachers and rulers, knew that no authority could be found in Scripture for their traditions. They realized that in spiritual understanding Jesus was far in advance of them. Yet they were angry because he did not obey their dictates. Failing to convince him, they sought Joseph and Mary and sought set before them his course of non-compliance. Thus he suffered rebuke and censure. So now, let's write on the board now the various levels of pressure brought to bear against Jesus Christ. we we'll put here again the name of God his Father and Christ down here 
whose task it was to receive orders from his father and to obey those orders, while of course obeying his mother as far as that was consistent with the commands of God. We find now that first of all there were the Jewish uh, teachers, I'll just put here the word rabbis, because the word rabbi meant teacher, and when they personally uh, failed to um, coerce Christ or to convince Christ that they sh he should obey them, then they um, sought and obtained the cooperation of the parents of Jesus Christ, that is Joseph and Mary. As we've just read, failing to convince him, they sought Joseph and Mary and set before them his course of non-compliance. Thus he suffered rebuke and censure. Now, uh, whom did the parents naturally tend to favour in this in this drama? Rabbi. The rabbis. Why? Because, as we as we said in our last study period, the rabbis had worked very hard over the centuries to establish their position of authority, so that the people would, would fear them and respect them and obey them, and of course that would guarantee their um, their financial base of operations. In a little while we come to the story of John the Baptist in the, in the very next chapter, there might be two, we find that when the representatives from Jerusalem, not the next chapter, it's right down uh, in the chapter called we found the, you know, the voice in the wilderness, right? And um, in that particular chapter we find that um, when, when the Jewish, when the delegates from the... Um, there's a chapter called We Have Found the Messiah on page 133. And the delegates from the Sanhedrin arrived at the baptismal site where John the Baptist was preaching. And the scripture, the scripture says, A multitude were gathered listening to his words when the delegates approached with an air of authority designed to impress the people and to command the deference of the prophet, the haughty rabbis came with a... The, the haughty rabbis came... With a move of respect, almost of fear, the crowd opened to let them pass. The great men in their rich robes and the pride of rank and power stood before the prophet of the wilderness. So built into the minds of the people, there was, was a fear of these haughty religious leaders. When I was just an early teenager, I used to enjoy reading uh, medieval church history. The story of the Reformation in England, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in uh, Switzerland and so forth. And I recall once reading about the way in which the Roman Catholic priests kept the people under their command in England. When any spirit of independence began to show amongst the people, when they began to search the scriptures for themselves, began to ask questions, the priests would rise up in great anger and promptly shut the church doors, conduct no more funerals nor weddings, and render no service to the people whatsoever. And I thought, I thought to myself, well, that's a pretty futile exercise because the people could simply say, well, so much to you priests, we can manage ourselves. We can approach God without going through a priest. And um, the people should then, I thought, have conducted uh, meetings at home in their colleges, stay the word of God amongst themselves and let the priests go hopping. But to my amazement, I found that the people were very quick to bow to this kind of pressure. And... Um, it didn't take very long for the priests to have them back where they wanted them. The churches reopened and the old servitude continued. But I said to myself, well, that's the Middle Ages, that's the Dark Ages, that's the period of ignorance and superstition that couldn't happen in our time. Well, those were certainly words I had to learn the, learn the truth of eventually because to my amazement I found that the same fear exists today to a large extent and even in the Seventh Day Adventist Church at the present time people have a very, very real fear of the ministry. Have you noticed it? Mm -hmm. It's a very real fear. And I've seen people who have come out and listened to this message have told me it's a wonderful message. It's the very life we have been waiting for. And then when the minister comes along to visit that person a few hours later and says, have you been listening to this, this uh, preacher? And they tell him they have. And he then begins to talk to them very threateningly and they instantly bow to that kind of pressure. I'm amazed about it, but it happens the same today as, as it ever happened. And in the days of Jesus Christ, the rabbis had a grip on the minds of Jesus' parents, and it was not difficult for them to, to get their cooperation in bringing pressure to bear upon Christ. And his mother, I, I dare say in particular, must have rather tearfully suggested to Jesus Christ he ought to pay more respect to the religious leaders. 
to which Christ would answer the boy Christ would answer very respectfully that he could not unless they brought to him the requirements of God's word now as we read on page 86 further it goes on to say at a very early age Jesus had begun to act for himself in the formation of his character and not even respect and love for his parents could turn him from obedience to God's word it is written was his reason for every act that, that varied from the family customs but the influence of the rabbis made his life a bitter one even in his youth he had to learn the hard lesson of silence and patient endurance now when we today claim the promises of God in regard to our children remember that uh, I read to you yesterday from the same book Desire of Ages page 17 that every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did which means of course that the ministry of the Holy Spirit will be given to our children to teach them very accurately the great and profound truths of God's word and it is very possible that because of that children may even advance beyond our level of experience if we, if we don't watch ourselves and maintain a very close communion with God ourselves and most certainly back there Jesus Christ had advanced well beyond the experience of his parents hadn't he? that is his earthly parents, his mother and stepfather well beyond their experience and because of that the poor child had to act very much on his own to maintain that level of experience developed in him for the ministry of the Holy Spirit so, so as I said uh, in the last couple of days the work of saving our children is a work of saving ourselves as a, as a parent ministers to the child the child in turn ministers back to the parent and uh, the parent must therefore be very diligent to ensure that he does that he and she do remain well ahead of their children in the work of character development and spiritual experience so that our children will find a companionship in their parents such as Christ did not find in his parents we should walk together as a united family unit the parents leading the way and the children following all the way through until they finally of course become adults themselves and move out to live an independent life <clears throat> so then the life of Jesus Christ was made a bitter one because he had to walk so totally alone even in his childhood but despite that pressure what did he maintain his holiness which was his obedience and his faith of course um, this made things rather complex because no doubt, he, no doubt with great certainty of course he had to sort out how to maintain the delicate balance between parental obedience and, and obedience to his heavenly father and uh, there were times of course when he had to actually disobey his parents in order to maintain his trust in God because when they said to him please respect the rabbis and do as they say could Christ obey that kind of command? No he couldn't so therefore in some respects he would be looked upon as, as a disobedient child whereas in fact of course he was being obedient to the higher power of his father up in heaven now let's look now at the next um, group of people that brought pressure to bear upon Jesus and those were his brothers alright so we'll put down now his brothers they were not of course his full brothers they were the sons of Joseph <clears throat> as we now read his brothers as the sons of Joseph were called sided with the rabbis they insisted that, they insisted that, the, that the traditions must be heeded if they were, as if they were the requirements of God they even regarded the precepts of men more highly than the, than the word of God and they were greatly annoyed at the clear penetration of Jesus in distinguish between the false and the true his strict obedience to the law of God they condemned the stubbornness they were surprised at the knowledge and wisdom he showed in answering the rabbis they knew that he had not received instruction from the wise men yet they could not but see that he was an instructor to them they recognized that his education was of, a type, was of a higher type than their own but they did not discern that he had access to the tree of life a source of knowledge of which they were ignorant now were these brothers of uh, or these so called brothers of Jesus older or younger than he they were older right they were the sons of Joseph by a previous marriage now when they were older than he what did they feel that that, that um, seniority gave them in respect to Christ what should younger brothers do to older brothers tell them what to do and obey that's right they expected to obey the older brother 
I noticed in the little book uh, Child Guidance statement by Sister White that says that we should take a special care to train the firstborn child because he or she will become the educator of the ones who come along afterwards and therefore the more faithfully we, we, train, we train the firstborn child then the influence of that child will have a good effect upon the other children so those brothers claimed then they said now we are older than you and because we are older than you you should obey us and your parents and the rabbis now the parents and the rabbis agree with us and that makes three to one the three classes to one class more than three people of course and therefore you ought to obey us because of who you are namely the younger child in the family but is that a guideline for behavior no it's not what is the only guideline every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God that's the only guideline because those brothers did not respect that guideline we find that every principle of their lives was a wrong principle that for instance they said you must heed the traditions even as if they were the requirements of God they regarded the precepts of men more highly than the word of God and they were irritated, greatly annoyed at the clear penetration of Jesus in distinguish, distinguishing between the false and the true. Now these, these brothers then were, were possessed of that satanic spirit, that satanic darkness which prevents a person from intellectually assessing the evidence. In other words, they were, they were moved by emotion they are moved by prejudice they are moved by pride and by opinion and those emotions governed their lives so they were not able to pay any respect to that which ought to have been respected and that, is the, and that was the superior dignity the superior knowledge the superior righteousness and purity of the life of Jesus Christ what they should have done was, was to recognize that and then come to Christ and had him teach them if they had done that of course they would have made a very wise move on their own behalf now we'll move on now to find another pressure source that Satan used to um, bring the burden to bear upon Jesus. Again I'll read from page 86 in the same book Desire of Ages. Christ was not exclusive and he had given special offence to the Pharisees by departing in this respect from their rigid rules. So now we come to the Pharisees and they were of course a very powerful element in Jewish society probably the most powerful element of all in Jewish society I read a little further now he founded the main of religion fenced in by high walls of seclusion as too sacred a matter for everyday life these walls of petition were he overthrew in his contact with men he did not ask what is your creed to what church do you belong he exercised his helping power in behalf of all who needed help instead of secluding himself in a hermit's cell in order to show his heavenly character he laboured earnestly for humanity he inculcated the principle that Bible religion does not consist in the mortification of the body he taught that pure and undefiled religion is not meant only for set times and special occasions at all times and in all places he manifested a loving interest in men and shed about uh, him the light of a cheerful piety all this was a rebuke to the Pharisees it showed that religion does not consist in selfishness and that their morbid devotion to personal interest was far from being true godliness this had roused their enmity against Jesus so that they tried to enforce his conformity to their regulations alright so now all these combined forces the, uh, the least of all being his parents of course but here we find now that the great enemy had enlisted these forces so here we find now here is Satan and Satan through the rabbis through his parents through his brothers and through the Pharisees brought tremendous pressure to bear upon a child in order to break that child's faith in God and lead him to give up his faith in the Almighty and turn to the ways of men now do you envy the life of Christ? that was pressure wasn't it? I mean when you think of a child just a, a little fellow who is, who is um, in contact with the divine life of God building a holy life a life of obedience and faith having that kind of pressure against him and no one with him nobody if it was an unprotected child from the worldly point of view there he was 
Now, if Jesus Christ and the power of God could maintain a path, a life of unfailing obedience and perfect faith against that kind of pressure in that kind of environment, then what excuse do we have for, for, for sinning? What excuse do we have? Because it's a shame, doesn't it? <laughs> it really puts us to shame. In, in the... Um, we think of the man Christ Jesus and, and we think of his ability to withstand temptation and to come through victorious and that, that is much more intelligible to us but to think of a little boy, just a little fellow running around as, as the little boys in this room are doing and against all that pressure, now if he had all the help of those people if all of those were righteous people and they were standing around him and protecting him and praying for him and guiding and blessing him then of course we'd understand how he maintained a perfect life at that age level but when at that age level he had all that against him it's a miracle of divine preservation that he could live and did live a life in which there was no trace of sin whatsoever a life of perfect and complete holiness in every sense of the word and remember this that Sister White says that our children can gain knowledge as Jesus did they can grow as, as, as the Saviour grew in fact in the book Sons and Daughters of God there's a very, very wonderful statement there which tells us that Jesus Christ, the life of Christ as a child is an example of what, of what the lives of our children can be at the same level. So there is a picture of what your child can be. Is that inspiring? I don't have it in my head, no, I'm sorry. I don't have the book here. If I had the book, I'd find it, but I don't have the book. It's about, uh, oh, probably, about probably about page 80 to 100, somewhere, about, somewhere in that region is where you'd find it uh, there are some statements there in that regard when I get home I'll look them up again and uh, include them in the studies I'll give it later <clears throat> now the chapter now goes on to talk about the devotional life of Jesus the way in which he maintained that uh, experience and we'll pick out some of the major points bearing in mind of course that this is all summed up in the book Ministry of Healing in a chapter entitled With Nature and With God and the very first sentence or the very first little paragraph says the Saviour's life on earth was a life of communion with nature and with God in this communion he revealed for us the secret of a life of power now that word power there has a very very broad meaning it doesn't simply mean power to do things it also means power to resist temptation and um when I read to you about the love of God being developed in our, our life experience with communion with God it is a fact and I'm learning by my own personal experience it's a fact that when you receive the inflow of Christ's life and Christ's love day by day your taste for this world grows less and less the things you once found quite an interest in become completely, completely uninter uninteresting to you whatsoever and you don't have to, I found I don't have to worry too much about possibly resisting temptation what I do find so effective is to fill your life with the love and life of God and that the taste for these things just fades right away completely and the taste for better things dominates in the place of what was there before and when people ask me the question well, why do you really believe in the spirit of prophecy it's because I find that in these books is the perfect and complete answer to my soul's need and my confidence in them is because I find in them the presence of more than human power I find they're the presence of divine power now, the next paragraph on page 87 talks about the fact that Jesus worked to relieve every case of suffering which he saw <clears throat> which of course was a positive outworking of the indwelling presence of love compassion and sympathy and the revelation that was developed in him the character of his own divine father up in heaven the next paragraph says all this displeased these brothers being older than Jesus they felt that he should be under their dictation they charged him with thinking himself superior to them and reproved him for setting himself above their teachers and the priests and rulers of the people often they threatened and tried to intimidate him but he passed on making the scriptures his guide now you know how elder brothers can treat younger brothers don't you they, they can beat them and, um, and really give them a very very bad time <clears throat> but uh, Christ seemed to just simply quietly pass on he didn't, uh, he didn't stand there and defy them didn't stand there and answer back he just simply slipped away and left them to simmer down all by themselves a very effective uh, course of action to say the least of it 
Jesus loved his brothers and treated them with unfailing kindness, but they were jealous of him and manifested the most decided unbelief and contempt. They could not understand his conduct. Great contradictions presented themselves in Jesus. He was the divine son of God and yet a helpless child. The creator of the wars, the earth was his possession and yet poverty marked his life experience at every step. He possessed a dignity and individuality wholly distinct from earthly pride and assumption. He did not strive for worldly greatness and even the lowliest position he was content. This angered his brothers. They could not account for his constant serenity under trial and deprivation. They did not know that for our sake he had become poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. They could not understand the mystery of his mission no more than the friends of Job could understand his humiliation and suffering. Now I love this paragraph very, very much because it is a revelation to me of what our children can be if they receive a like education as Christ received. Just let's go back and sample and enjoy some of the great statements found in this particular paragraph. He possessed a dignity and individuality wholly distinct from earthly pride and assumption. Now, in other words, the dignity of Jesus Christ was Dignity means um, a certain authority, it means a certain um, self-respect, it means um, something that is admirable in the person, something which draws you to that person as one who has in himself a capacity for dealing with the problems of life. Now men of course, men of course put on dignity, don't they? Uh, the, the worldly people in their pride make themselves dignified by wearing expensive clothing, occupying high positions, uh, demanding and getting respect from their fellow men and and so forth and when great presidents and kings and so forth um, present a dignified appearance and, and, and thereby command respect from different people is something which they labor to put upon themselves but the dignity which Christ possessed was something which was natural to him it was an endowment received because of the possession in him of the living power of God and that dignity of course uh, commanded respect from others and was a protection to him physically, mentally and spiritually now the next uh, sentence that he did not strive for worldly greatness and in even the lowliest position he was content now with the true child of God position is the least important thing in the world right? you find this more and more in your own experience and becomes less and less important whether, whether you occupy a great position or a lowly position doesn't matter. In fact, um, it is always when a church um, or before a church begins to apostatize that you, that you find that there are no such things as popes or presidents, elders, bishops and such like in the sense of those being superior positions. A.T. Jones has some very wonderful thoughts on this in the book Lessons from the Reformation. But as the church steps into apostasy, then we begin to find a stratified uh, pattern of uh, position developing from with one man at the top, a few men next to him, a few more next to them, a few more still next to them until you have a pyramid structure that comes back to the laity at the bottom of the scale. And the, the philosophy has eventually developed that the people at the bottom are there for no other reason than to enrich and to glorify the ones at the top. That's all they're there for so it doesn't matter how poor they are how ignorant they are provided they're there to provide the necessary support to the ones at the top and keep them rich and at ease so with Jesus Christ unlike his brothers he was not concerned with position in any sense of the word at all but when you have children in, in whom is the spirit of disobedience and you see children at play what do you invariably find a, a strife for amongst children the top place don't you they fight for leadership they want to be the one that rides the tractor or the bicycle they want to be at the top and have the rest following and there's many 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 conflicts arise amongst children because that spirit is right there from the very beginning but in Jesus Christ the spirit wasn't there and it will not be there in those of our children who like him receive the same kind of training and education now his brothers could not understand for his continual serenity now serenity of course is peace, it's rest and Jesus Christ therefore understood the Sabbath rest principles he followed those principles and therefore he entered into God's rest even under trial and deprivation they could not understand the mystery of his mission 
any more than the friends of Job could understand his humiliation and suffering. Now what a beautiful character the boy Jesus had. There is a picture of a truly holy life, a life that lived by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God, a life which was obedient to God's every command, and a child who lived by unceasing faith in his heavenly Father. Now obviously, of course, uh, Christ... Um, was protected by angels but then don't we have the promise of that children likewise will have the special guardianship of holy angels to keep them from temptation and trouble next paragraph talks about the punctilious manner in which the brothers of Christ and the Jews generally speaking were uh, obedient to the rules and regulations made by men not to the rules and regulations made by God and the next paragraph says of the bitterness that falls to a lot of humanity there was no part which Christ did not taste remember a few years ago when we studied the incarnation of Jesus Christ we dwelt heavily upon the text which says that Christ was tempted in all things like as we are tempted yet without sin remember that scripture from Hebrews and now we find that that is and of course the emphasis back there was a message to the adults more than the children and the emphasis back there was that Christ is an example to grown up people a proof that they do not need to form to sin because he has gone that way before us and suffered every temptation that we can possibly suffer but here we find that as a child of, of the bitterness that falls to the lot of humanity there is no part which Christ did not taste so if you find yourself misunderstood and persecuted by the religious teachers of today so is Christ as a child if you find your parents against you so Christ experienced that as a child if you find your relatives and brethren are against you, Christ has been that way before you. And if you find that the, that the rulers are against you, Christ also experienced that. So what can you experience even as a child that Christ did not experience as a child? Nothing. He's tasted every bitterness, every opposition, every difficulty, every pressure, which can ever be brought to bear upon mankind. And he maintained in that a life of perfect and varying holiness, true obedience, living by every word which comes from the mouth of God and demonstrate no matter how great the pressure may be upon anybody we can bear it as Christ bore it and our children can go unscathed through these things as well now if you find then that in your situation God does not deliver your children from state school which may be quite possible don't be discouraged but remember that with all these provisions if that child is where God permits him to be God will keep that child in that environment. He'll come through it unscathed as Jesus came through it unscathed even in that wicked city of Nazareth. In the past, of course, we put too much emphasis on getting our children in a good environment. We now need to recognize that they need to have a good character or a good life in them. That's where the emphasis must be placed. I'll read a little further now. There are those who tried to cast contempt upon him because of his birth and even in his childhood he had to meet their scornful looks and evil whisperings now what did they call him? and they're legitimate didn't they? right or a bastard which is the word we use these days to describe that kind of person now today of course uh, because of the breakdown in morals and, and for other reasons too or based on a false morality let me put it that way because because no true Christian will ever ever disparage a person because they may have had an unfortunate birth will they? true, true morality will never do that but there was a false morality back there a false righteousness which grossly uh, exaggerated one particular sin namely adultery above all other sins that became the great sin that you just didn't do and um, in those days to be described as an illegitimate was indeed to heap upon a person the utmost contempt and scorn and uh, the parents of the children back there saw to it that Jesus Christ and the Pharisees too saw to, saw to it that Jesus Christ was given that very very disparaging category he had, if he had responded in, by an impatient word or look and note that if he, if he had responded by an impatient word or look if he had conceded to his brothers by even one wrong act he would have failed of being a perfect example thus he would have failed of carrying out the plan for our redemption had he even admitted that there could be an excuse for sin Satan would have triumphed and the world would have been lost this, this is what attempt to work to make his life as trying as possible that he might be led to sin now Satan of course is an expert and when he labours to make a person's life as trying as possible 
and when he has all these agencies at his command <coughs> and when he has when he has the victim isolated then is Satan able to, to give a person a bad time yeah. he certainly is And here is a picture of Satan doing his absolute worst, using, employing all his cunning, all his skill, all his knowledge, all the practiced uh, um, devices of the past, and, and he left no stone unturned to cause Jesus Christ to commit just one wrong act, to make one concession, to return one impatient look or word to his brothers. That's all he had to do in order to succeed. So certainly put Christ at a tremendous disadvantage, but just the same, he won through and the plan of salvation was not marred. Now, let's notice how Jesus Christ met these temptations. It says, but to every temptation he had but one answer. And what was it? It is written. It is written. Or, these are God's orders. As we progress through the various experiences that Christ had in the early part of his life, as far as we'll get you in his campground, or camp time I'm going to demonstrate again and again how the question what are my orders and what are the promises and by Christ confining himself to obeying the one and believing the other was a perfect device for protecting him from falling under temptation when he confined himself to those two things and didn't worry about anything else but that what are my orders and what are the promises and he obeyed the one and believed the other he had perfect protection from temptation every time, and so will we. I'll read a little further now. He rarely rebuked any wrongdoing of his brothers, but he, but he had a word from God to speak to them. Often he was accused of cowardice for refusing to unite with them in some forbidden act, but his answer was, It is written, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Now, of course, there were some who saw his society feeling at peace in his presence <clears throat> but many avoided him because they were rebuked by his stain stainless life young companions urged him to do as they did he was bright and cheerful they enjoyed his presence and welcomed his ready suggestions but they were impatient at his scruples and pronounced his nar him narrow and straight laced Jesus, Jesus answered it is written wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed there to, according to thy word Thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 119, 9 and 11. <coughs> now we move on now to a very, very wonderful element in the life of Jesus Christ. And it was the fact that he never, ever contended for his rights. Now, did Jesus Christ have rights? Everybody has, don't we? We all have rights. But Christ never contended for them. And uh, if a person sought to deprive him of his rights, he let that person deprive him of his rights. Often his task was made unnecessarily severe because he was willing and uncomplaining. Yet he did not fail nor become discouraged. He lived above these difficulties as if in the light of God's countenance. He did not retaliate when roughly used, but bore insult patiently. Again and again he was asked, Why do you submit to such despiteful usage, even from your brothers? It is written, he said, and here's his answer, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments, for length of days and long life and peace shall I add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favour and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Now this paragraph is well worth some consideration the question was asked him why do you submit to such despiteful usage even from your brothers why submit to this usage now the alternative was the brother said to him now either you will do as we say or we shall give you some despiteful usage we'll, we'll treat you very badly so Christ was given the choice as a child between obeying the ways of his brothers and therefore the ways of men or suffering on account of his refusal to do so and always he chose quiet submission to the bad treatment. Now later on, of course, John the Baptist, um, Christ's counterpart, and Christ himself too for that matter. But when, for instance, John the Baptist was placed in prison, what was he suffering? He was suffering despiteful usage. For what reason? He would not depart from the ways of God. And John 
John patiently submitted himself to that despiteful usage in the prison cell, the suffering and punishment he had there, in order to maintain his living faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, um, Christ, the, the word he could have said that Christ suffered despiteful usage, so he submitted himself to it. Now, in the struggle that uh, we shall go through during Jacob's trouble, as we saw yesterday, there will be a reluctance upon our part to submit ourselves to the rigours and trials of that period, the despiteful usage of that period. We'll fight against God as we try very hard to escape from that kind of punishment instead of submitting to it. But Jesus Christ in his very childhood submitted to whatever the cost of believing the gospel was, whatever persecution might bring, whatever deprivation, whatever hardship, whatever bitterness, whatever scorn, whatever contempt, he submitted himself to it all, uncomplainingly, gladly enduring all that for the sake of the message and mission which he'd come to, to teach and to, and to fulfil. Now his answer was, why do you submit? The answer was, my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments, because they were given length of life and so forth. Now, ha can we today, and this is a good question to approach at, the, at this point in time, are we able today to see what Christ saw in God's commandments? Can you see the commandment which says submit to despiteful usage when, for, the, for the sake of the gospel? When you do the Ten Commandments, can you see that in those Ten Commandments? Then we should study until we can, shouldn't we? Right? We should not rest until we do see that principle there. Now, of course, the Ten Commandments are ten great negatives and uh, that law, as Paul plainly says, was added because of transgression and only lasts until the seed should come as the schoolmaster which brings us to Jesus Christ and what is the model for our lives what is the law of God to us the life of Christ Christ is our example okay and Christ said that the the, ten, that the law of God is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all thy might and thy neighbour as thyself that is the law of God the great outflowing principle of divine love the spirit of total self-sacrifice for the good of others. Now, to obey God, to love God with all the heart and with all the soul in this earth is a costly business because the more deeply you love God, the more singular you shall be in this modern society. And certainly in this room it shall be so singular because we all love God and in varying degrees we have the love of God in our hearts so it's not a singular experience in this room. But do we enjoy this company all the year through? We don't, do we? We go back to the bitter world from which we've come into, into this seclusion for a few days and out in that bitter world you're a very singular person as you have the love of God in your heart and inevitably in, in your divided families, in your work programs, wherever you may go, you're going to find that you'll have to submit to misuse, misunderstanding, contempt and so forth on the part of those who are around you but, by, but that act of submission is an acceptance upon your part of the cost that, that is involved in loving the Lord you go with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and therefore when asked if you ever are, are asked why do you submit you can simply say as Jesus says my son forget not my law and that great law is of course love to God supremely and your neighbour as yourself and as we realize that we are but suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ that this is but fellowship in his sufferings then we shall gladly bear that suffering on behalf of our Saviour just as he did as a child amongst his persecutors well I guess that's the end of that study period so I have to stop at this point and uh, take a little break for a few minutes and um, then carry on again any questions you'd like to ask before we do uh, break up from the study period Right, no questions then. It's now 25 uh, past 3. Let's come back at 20 minutes to 4. That gives a 15 minutes break and we'll then resume. That's